So um, what barriers exist for embedding this technology into things like electronic health records and radiology workflows? Yeah. So Mary Pasquale could really talk about this because, like I said, she is the workhorse. She's the one that got this up and running here. Um, and she went through a lot of no, no, no's before she got yes, yes, yes. And I think the one thing we learned in talking to our other consortium institutions are it's not a one shop fit all sort of thing. Um, the way you implement this is very dependent on the system, you know, and what the system has and what the system doesn't have. And so it's been really interesting to see how other systems kind of integrate this technology. You know, there was a great presentation sort of um, on day one of uh, the World uh, Lung Ca Cancer Conference that we just presented all this data at. It was a workshop, basically. And Dr. Finnelman, who was a radiologist who was at uh, Mass General, uh, who was very involved in implementing Sybil into the radiology workspace there, kind of talked about how you know, the implementation kind of works of this technology. It's actually easy. You know, when you see it laid out, it's not that hard. But, you know, these systems now have a lot of um, stops. And so you have to kind of navigate how to get around those stops. Um, and I think it's, it is going to be very much dependent on the system. I think the thing that Mary and others who have implemented it can provide is sort of a troubleshooting help, right? Because we've been through it. We've gone through all of these different iterations and gotten it to work. So she and others could be really helpful in other institutions that are looking to truly get this up and running at their place as sort of um, help to get get this, you know, tool integrated into their system, but it's going to be different for e everywhere. And when you say stops, you're talking about kind of the red tape around electronic health records and each institution's individual policies and practices. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, how might this tool alter the timing or frequency of CT scans and other standard lug screening uh, protocols? So that's always been my, so we have a Thursday morning meeting with the consortium, you know, 40, 50 people are on it every single Thursday. Um, and now, you know, we're, we're really interested in retrospective validation. We're also interested in prospective studies now, right? And we have some money from organizations that are going to fund some of those prospective um, opportunities. The intervention is, is what comes up a lot. How are you actually going to use, you know, the Sybil tool to make an, a change in treatment, right? I have so many patients that would come in and I could give, you know, a, a say, hey, you know, this is going to change, you know, you have a high risk score. We're going to screen you now three months instead of six months. They're still going to ask, but I want you to get the cancer before I, I don't want to ever get cancer. Right. And so how is that screening actually going to Im impact that? Or how is using Sybil actually going to impact that? I think that really gets at what we're trying to do here, which is integrate Sybil with sort of biomarkers that might predict, hey, this person, you're at a way higher risk, so you're going to develop lung cancer. Is there a preventative strategy in here that we, a, a medical preventative strategy, right, that we could use based on your biomarkers that could potentially, you know, ameliorate the risk of you even developing lung cancer? I think that's the, you know, that's what all of us hope that down the road, you know, sure, it's great. We're going to be diagnosing lung cancer very early, but we know there's still rec recurrences, even in stage one, right? And so how do we actually get to a point where people aren't developing lung cancer, right? And I think that, you know, that's some of the work that we're doing here, hopefully will add to that. Interesting.